it's a pleasure and an honor to announce Should I Stay or Should I Go? Algorithms in Public Spheres, Gillian York. Your stage and your applause. Hello. Um, well, thank you all for being here. I know it's really beautiful out there, um, and there's lots of competing things. Uh, so yeah, thank you for coming to see me. Um, so when I put this talk together, it was actually last year, and it was before a lot of the recent um, scandals around Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, uh, et cetera. And so what I was thinking at the time is really the age-old political question of, let's do this, ah, that's better. Um, the age-old political question of, do you, ref do you fight the system and tear things down and start from the beginning again, or do you try to reform? Um, so first, I just want to please raise your hand if you're still on Facebook in any way at all. Okay, awesome. Then you're my core audience, because last time I gave this talk, I asked the question, and maybe like 15 hands went up in a room of 100, and I was like, shit. Okay, I'm just gonna walk off the stage. Um, so the truth is that I'm still on Facebook too, even given the work that I do, which is around privacy and free expression. And I wrote a piece a couple of months ago right after uh, all of the stories around Cambridge Analytica, arguing that there's a lot of good reasons to still be there, and people were so angry at me for saying that. Um, they were angry because they felt that I was helping to prop up a really horrible um, and, uh, let's see, censorious, privacy-violating company. They were angry at me for you know, making excuses for why I'm still on this platform, but the truth is that I've got a couple of reasons. Um, one is, like, if anyone lives in Berlin and likes to party, which I imagine there are people here, um, I don't know how else you follow anything without using the events platform. Everyone is there, even the people who don't look at their profiles, don't check on their friends, they're still using it for events. And then the other reason is a little bit different. Um, there's, I'm not going to tell you details, but um, as a lot of people do, there are communities that are focused around certain issues, maybe things that you don't, that you're not public about, things that you keep private. Um, and a lot of people that I know, for health reasons, for kink reasons, for whatever reason, are using these Facebook groups, these closed groups, to interact with people that they couldn't find anywhere else otherwise. Oh, don't rip the cord. <laughs> um, and so, essentially, what I'm saying is that it's not so easy to leave. And that's why I put this talk together initially, um, and that's where my argument has been. So, as you've probably seen, there are a lot of campaigns like this going on. I don't know if anyone's seen this sticker. I haven't seen it here, but perhaps in some bars in Berlin or elsewhere, if you've been to maybe the Congress. Um, there's a campaign for not feeding the Google, to get all of your data off Google. And in theory, I kind of agree. I mean, if you, I don't know if you can see the tagline, but it says, decentralize all data and communications, software libre, so free software, and end-to-end -end encryption. So, I'm definitely down with the encryption. I'm all for that. Free software is great when it works, <laughs> which it often doesn't. Don't, don't at me. Um, decentralize all data and communications. Now, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more here, and I'll get into that in just a minute. And then, of course, uh, I already talked about this, but I just like memes, so I thought I'd share it with you. Okay, this chair is just hurting me at this point. Um, and then, yeah, so. Obviously, this is a pretty hot topic, because when I was searching for the memes to use, I found all sorts of different ones. Keep calm and quit Facebook, uh, not sure if I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, like I said, in practice, it's actually quite difficult. We talk a lot about the problems with all of these platforms, and I'm going to do this more here. And a lot of my colleagues and people that I know from the sort of digital rights and internet freedom communities urge people to leave these platforms behind, but we're not actually offering them a reasonable replacement for when they do leave. So we're telling them, go there, you know, leave this, leave this behind, don't use it. But what's the alternative? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this quote. It comes from the, inter, uh, the sorry, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Uh, this is the, one of the co-founders of my organization who passed away uh, earlier this year, John Perry Barlow. And he said, on behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. 
So he was speaking to governments. He was talking, this was written in 1996, and he was writing about the desires of the free and open internet community at the time. And this was, of course, before we had all of these aggregated centralized systems. The internet, of course, is inherently decentralized. Um, it's not controlled by one central point. And so he was arguing against governments, but I think what he and a lot of his contemporaries at the time, in the 1990s and even early 2000s, failed to do was notice the threat that was coming from the corporate world. Um, and so on the one hand, pushing back against government, but on the other hand, kind of welcoming the innovation that was coming from Silicon Valley. And a lot of that innovation was good, but of course a lot of it has turned out bad as well. So just to quickly touch on decentralization before I go into some of it. Well, you know what, I'll, I'll stay here for a moment. I'll talk about some of the bad and the good without my slides. So I've been working on this issue for quite a few years now, and I've been looking specifically at the ways that these companies like Facebook, like Twitter, like Google, and there are many others out there, of course. They're not the only ones, they're just the big ones. I've been looking at the way that these companies are restricting people's privacy on the one hand, but then on the other hand, there's another thing that I think is really interesting, is this centralized control that's happening around cultural issues, around speech. And so the past few months have kind of changed my premise on this talk because over the past few months, what we've seen is these companies not doing enough about hate speech, about hateful speech, and maybe some of you were here for the previous talk, which touched on those issues. But I'm, I'm gonna put that aside for now because there's another thing that I think is happening that I'd like to mention, which is that the way that the policies of these various platforms are crafted is, how do I say, very American. Um, fundamentally, what the way that the policies on Facebook work is, um, you know, you're not allowed to have um, nudity, for example. You're not allowed to have sexual content. You can't have um, marijuana sales. Not, uh, not, not legal on Facebook, even though they're legal in a number of states in the U.S. But on the other hand, violence is often okay, um, both in visual form and in terms of language. There's a lot of leeway for hateful speech. Uh, for threats, a lot of leeway, even until recently for gun sales. But on the other hand, you can't have some of the things that you would see freely here, such as, again, like nudity. And so these, these rule sets are really, it's, it's American companies exporting American cultural values to the rest of the world and imposing them on them. And so that's why I want to get into this talk about decentralization a little bit more, um, because I think that there is something here for us to look at. So, I think everyone's familiar, just generally speaking, with the concept of decentralization in our lives. Don't think too technical. I'm not even really getting into the network uh, questions here. What I'm thinking about is where the control is located. So rather than having a central node, we're talking about control from a number of different nodes. And this is something that's not going on in these corporations. Now, there are some pros and cons to decentralization. I want to just touch on those briefly. First, of course, are the pros, which are great. Um, more ownership and control over your data, over your speech, over what you can say, what you can do, um, and what people can do in groups. So right now, as I mentioned, I, again, I talk about Facebook a lot because I'm doing specific research there, so I know the rules by heart, but this is true for a lot of companies. Um, so if you're using a private group in Facebook, which I'm sure a lot of us do, you don't functionally have control over what people can do. Yes, you can moderate it as an administrator, but there's still centralized control. So an example of this is uh, there are a number of groups that are focused around childbirth, and there are people who share practices, maybe they share images, um, and those photographs that they share in particular are often censored. And the reason for this is because if I see something and I report you, um, then it goes through this queue of content moderation, uh, and in the past it was always a human content moderator that would look at that, con that look at that image, judge it, and decide whether or not it should stay or go. Now what we're seeing though is increased algorithmic uh, control over this stuff, and so we're seeing machine learning tools being used to identify images and speech uh, increasingly, and make a decision or a determination as to whether or not that content should stay or go. And so when it comes to things like childbirth imagery, nudity, um, and even weaponry, flags, other things that are banned, uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that maybe in Q&A, um, those things are easily identified by the machine learning tools 
that these companies employ. And so they're very, it's very easy for them to sift through and then say, okay, this is a, a PKK flag, this one's banned, this is a German flag, that's okay. Same with bodies. Uh, it's very easy for them to make decisions about bodies, the human body, because of the way that um, the filtering works. And so I would like to see you know, more control over data, and that's one way to see that happen. Um, of course, other reasons, privacy and community use, uh, authenticity through blockchain, which I'm not going to get into a whole lot. I'm not as interested in that. I'm sure maybe some people here are. Um, potentially better security if you're having your own control over a platform. And of course, as I mentioned before, potentially greater freedom of expression, but that also comes with costs, of course. Um, but I also think that when you allow people to moderate their own spaces and create their own spaces, just as we're doing here at this festival, um, the decisions are much more organic, the decisions that we make about what's acceptable and what's not, rather than having them come top down from either a government or a corporation. But on the other hand, the cons of decentralization, um, it's not really scalable. So if we have a platform that works for our community, it might not work for another community and another one beyond that. Um, and so the technology itself is not always scalable. I think discovery is another one. One of the things that I get joy out of on Facebook, because there's so little at this point, um, but one of the things that I get joy out of is when I meet someone at a place like this and I add them, uh, seeing all of the people that we both know is often really cool. And so things like that don't necessarily exist when you're segmenting all of uh, your communications. Um, of course, content moderation, it requires more human labor. And I think that this is an interesting thing too because as I mentioned before, a lot of these corporate platforms, excuse me, Thank you. Um, a lot of these corporate platforms are, are essentially requiring me and you and other people to be the police. Um, we're the ones policing these platforms, at least until algorithms and, and machine learning arrived on the scene. And so if I see something I don't like, I have to report it. And then of course the labor cost of that is huge and often the people doing the work um, are based in the Philippines and other countries. They're not getting paid as much. They're not getting the same training. And what you end up having is a system whereby um, people in the developing world are you know, cleaning the, the, these platforms or cleaning the internet so that we don't have to see these horrible images. And so if you take that to a decentralized model, it also becomes problematic because then you have um, me and you and everyone in our community responsible for that content as well. Maybe it's more ethical, but it's still just as much labor. And then of course, potentially less security, privacy, and freedom of expression. That can go both ways as well. And so I just want us to think a little bit more about these huge platforms and the ways that we use them. Um, I don't know if these numbers are, can, I, can you see them okay, yeah? These numbers are really interesting to me because when I first put this, these statistics together, I was not sure where I was going with that slide. Um, this slide is a couple years old, these numbers have actually gone up, but I've been putting it in different talks. So when I first looked at these numbers, 1.28 billion daily active users on Facebook, 1 billion users in, on YouTube, 313 million monthly on Twitter, um, I thought, huh, these numbers look really familiar to me, and this is why. This is the scale that they're at. We're really looking at numbers that are comparable to the world's three most populous countries. Um, and so these are not communities as their CEOs would have you think. These really are, hmm, they're not countries either, obviously. They're not nation states. But on scale, uh, the problems that they have, the ways that they function, look nothing like the kind of communities that I think we want to see. And then of course, I talked a little bit about the rules earlier, but I'll just leave up that slide. Um, I think this one's actually a little out of date anyway, but the way that the word community actually shows up here one, two, three, four, five times on this page, the diversity of our global community. Um, Facebook, uh, the conversations reflect the diversity of a community of more than one people. So again, they're using the word community, but it isn't really a community. And so as we increasingly move into a world where machine learning and algorithms are being employed to make decisions about what we can and cannot see, what we can and cannot do, and even about, <laughs> even about other uh, things, 
about our behavior on these platforms, I think that we should be concerned and we should be considering the concept of reformation, of reforming the way that they function. And that's kind of what I do in my daily life. Um, I can tell you that I've probably talked to at least one of these companies, I won't name it, but maybe five times in the past month as they rethink certain policies that they have. Um, and I'm often trying to push them in certain directions. And they often don't listen and occasionally they do. Um, but there is a growing campaign and there is a growing movement to try to push them in the right direction, at least on certain policies, to give the users of these platforms more due process, to give them uh, so the right to appeal, really, the right to, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice up here. So to give people more due process, the right to appeal decisions that are made without their consent, there is a movement pushing them to be more transparent about their practices, both in terms of reporting to the public and reporting to the individual when their content is removed or taken down. Um, but I think that as these machine learning technologies are increasingly employed, we're going to see less and less of that kind of transparency um, because they're functionally, they're black boxes. I'm just gonna flip through a couple more examples because I did my talk in the wrong order. I forgot the slides were over here. All right, so to answer the question in the end, what do we do? Do we build new institutions or do we fix the ones that we already have? And if you think of these platforms as institutions, um, I think that it's important to remember that, you know, and, and I think my answer really at this point is to reform them, although, you know, if you wanna bring them to the ground, I'm not going to stop you. Um, and I think the reasons for me is this. It's often the most vulnerable users who are impacted by uh, changes in policy by the way that algorithms are, <coughs> so sorry. <laughs> it's often the most vulnerable users who are impacted by algorithmic bias. It's often the most vulner vulnerable users who are impacted by policy changes, by uh, privacy violations, by freedom of expression violations. So think not just of ourselves, but also about the users in places like Myanmar, who on the flip side of this, you know, have been demanding more content moderation, have been asking for more intervention into the incitement that's happening in their country on that very platform against um, certain populations, particularly the Rohingya Muslim population. And so if we build decentralized networks, we might, you know, we're building something for ourselves, but we're... <laughs> but we're potentially, well, sorry, we're potentially denying access to millions or even billions of people at the same time. And so I think that this is a question that has to be weighed really carefully. Um, and with that, and because I'm losing my voice, I think I'm gonna go into Q&A now because uh, otherwise you're just gonna find me coughing again. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I'm more than happy to take a breath and answer questions. Ooh, that was quicker than expected. I apologize, I'm losing my voice up here. <laughs> Do you have enough water? Shall we get you some more water? Or that's, that's fine. Yeah. Well, then questions, answers, uh, please. Um, Make yourself uh, noticeable and I'm going to come over. Well, then we don't need any water anymore, do we? <laughs> there we go. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, because nobody likes to ask a question, I'm going to ask you one specific um, thing you mentioned. Um, you talked about hate speech. And um, what's your idea? What's your best um, vision of the future for this platforms around hate speech? Because in my opinion, every speech is hate speech. Everyone can interpret anything as hate speech. So um, I'm quite afraid of a dystopian society where somebody will police speech and we won't be say uh, we won't be able to say anything. So, what's your view? Uh, on 
Sure, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question because I think it gets more and more complicated. Um, so I wanna say that I'm, I'm American, quite obviously, if you hadn't guessed, um, and I'm not a free speech absolutist, so I'm not really always in line with um, the First Amendment, or at least, not the First Amendment, but the American approach to the First Amendment, the way that it's interpreted, um, and the way that people yell free speech about everything in the US. Um, but, my question is always not, okay, you know, should we, um, or my answer is not that all speech is created equal, but rather that who do we trust to make decisions about speech? And I think that that's always the fundamental question that we should be asking. So my concern, <coughs> so sorry. My concern with hate speech in particular and the way that platforms treat it is if you look at Facebook alone, the way that they adjudicate these decisions, and I could just go back on my slide for a second and show you one. The way that they adjudicate these decisions is often wrong. Um, and when I say wrong, I mean not in line with Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the ICCPR, both of which you know, govern speech, allow for freedom of expression with certain exceptions that include incitement and truly egregious hateful speech. Um, in this particular case, ah, here's one. So this is a great example. Um, so the word dyke, I think people are familiar with it in English, uh, used to be used almost entirely as a slur against lesbians, and then was reclaimed by the community and is now used in positive ways by lesbians. And so, pretty easy binary there. You've got it as a hateful word and as a positive reclaimed word. But in this case, Facebook saw that word, realized that it could be used in both hateful and harmful and good ways, and decided to just nix it entirely. And we've seen this happen in a number of different cases with different terms. And so, I think that <laughs> just in case I have another one here. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I think that really this is where I would like to see more user control. I don't think that trusting, first trusting a company that's an American company to decide what is hateful and what is not for the entire world, I don't think that works. It's, they've shown that it doesn't work. Second, I am actually genuinely concerned about the fact that we're outsourcing all of this work to people in the Philippines. Um, there's a film right now that you can see in cinemas. I helped it on it a little bit. I helped work on it called The Cleaners. It's playing in Berlin. Um, and it shows the impact of this work on the laborers who do it. Um, and I remind you, like they're getting paid far less than their counterparts in Silicon Valley. They don't have the psychological training and they're looking at you know, violent videos really nasty incitement, child pornography, all sorts of things. Um, and so I do think that we can, should be concerned and not just say, okay, Facebook, you should do more about this. And so in, in Germany with the Netzdegay law, I understand why people came up with it, but at the same time, it, it actually allows these companies to des determine for themselves what hate speech is. And so I would like to see users have more control. That's my answer. I, it's not a perfect answer, but for example, I think it's really strange and problematic that on Facebook, I can't filter out terms. I can't even filter Trump. If I don't wanna see anything about Donald Trump, um, I can't do that. There's no way to filter out that word. Uh, if you have a phobia of snakes, you can't filter out snakes. And these are technologies that exist that Facebook has right there, but they don't give them to users because they want to retain centralized control. Um, it's not a perfect answer, but if we were allowed to if we were given the tools to both filter for ourselves and for our own smaller communities, user communities, I think that that would be a much better situation because people could agree for themselves what's acceptable. Now, of course, I think that some things are beyond the pale. That includes things, of course, like child sexual abuse, um, incitement to violence, um, but not, again, I would agree with you and say that not everything that these companies or even some governments call hate speech is hate speech. Jillian. Shall we try another question, or shall we call it a day? I can do one more. Yeah, yeah, there is one more. Is there one more? There is one more. I promise I haven't been screaming. This is just from allergies. <laughs> Um, one question I have is like, um, you share like two options. We have like leave Facebook or stay on Facebook. And um, what I have in mind is like, how can we have an impact on Facebook like to be more decentralization? Like, like have like, as a German, I think like, yeah, write an angry letter to Facebook. How can it change something? And um, 
do you have like for example what's going on like some com or like institutions whatever try to have an impact on Facebook or what can I do as a user or like yeah yeah so I think that there's things that individuals can do and there's things that are happening within this movement that I briefly mentioned and then probably forgot and skipped over to another thing so on the movement side of things um, over the past year we've actually seen more Uh, successful advocacy towards these companies changing their policies than I've seen in 10 years. And I've been doing this for about 10 years, looking at uh, the impact of platforms, social media platforms. Um, so in the past year, we've seen the creation of a set of principles. They're called the Santa Clara principles uh, that really, like, really specifically demand certain types of transparency and due process appeals uh, from these companies. Um, then my organization does a report every year that ranks these companies on various um, elements. And this year for the very, f it used to be on privacy, this year for the first time, we did it on these various measures that I just mentioned, uh, appeals, transparency, uh, so three different measures of transparency, um, and et cetera. You can look at it, it's called Who Has Your Back? It's on EFF's website. Um, and we're starting to see a coalition forming from the organizations that created these, these different sets of principles. Um, and a lot of them are organizations in the global south, which I'm really happy about because I think that often those are the users who are impacted the most by the policies that are created by Americans and imposed on them. Um, but then what can we do as users? I mean, I, I think that Calling for people to, you know, just quit or even take a day off has not really had any impact. We've seen that, you know, we've seen these kinds of protests. There was like the delete Facebook day. Um, people were deactivating their accounts for a day, but boycott in the traditional sense doesn't really work. And so I think that we can, we can give them less data. We can con use the control that we have, the existing control that we have over our privacy settings um, to, you know, ensure that we're giving them as little as possible. We can turn off um, you know, I mean, there, there's two actually, two different sets of privacy settings. Most people only know about one of them. So Facebook gives you this nice little privacy checkup that you can go through and ensure that you're giving them the minimum amount of data possible. But there's actually like a deeper set of privacy settings that are harder to find, and that's by design. Um, but I think beyond that, you know, I think that joining these movements and calling for these same things and having us get, you know, getting us to, like we're only now in 10 years of me doing this work, we're only now getting to a point where a number of different organizations are agreeing with each other and calling for the same things. And so I'm, I'm kind of hopeful, um, in so far as I can be hopeful. I, I know that that was only a half answer, but I'm gonna think more about it. <laughs> Shall we go for another one? Do we have one? I've got tea now. <laughs> What could possibly go wrong? Do, oh, here we go. I have one question because you said well, boycotting doesn't work. Um, I think there's another discussion coming up that is about antitrust, competition, these kind of things, um, which would kind of try to target the political or the, the power of the corporation as such and yeah. the economic uh, model, because I think it's, it's also not accidentally that they don't allow you to filter as you like you. They should allow you to filter because it's <coughs> against their kind of commercial interest. And um, so I'm not sure if working within their commercial uh, model really gives us enough reform options, or if you need to think more kind of getting at the economic model. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Um, so I should probably say that I'm one of 80 people at my organization, um, which means that I have a really narrow focus, but we actually just put something out while I was at Fusion, but I got to read a draft of it beforehand um, on that issue. And so if you're interested in what we're doing on it, it's there, I didn't write it, so I can't take credit for it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're starting to look at antitrust as a model. Um, I think that, you know, in the US, a lot of organizations like mine are, have been a bit late to the table on this issue um, because we've already seen these mergers happen between all of our telecoms um, without much pushback from, from different, you know, civil liberties and advocacy organizations. And so uh, without being an expert on that, I would say that I agree. <laughs> but I'm not an expert enough to give you any more information. Do we have more questions? Sure. Here we go. 
Um, can you explain what you really mean, like uh, antitrust Facebook? It's like, um, like a bubble or something. Like. I'm afraid that I can't, um, only because I, I am m almost ignorant of the way that antitrust law works in the US. And so anything that would come out of my mouth would be an absolute embarrassment to my colleagues who work really hard on it. Um, so I'm, I'm refraining only to not be that person who just talks. <laughs> But if you're interested, EFF.org, there should be a, a new piece up that makes this argument. Um, it, it, it will be very good, but I didn't write it. So sorry. Do we have more questions? Even in the back? Well, then I think we're going to call it a day. Thanks Thank for you. hanging in there. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> that was your second talk, wasn't it? It was, yes. It, it, <laughs> third one to follow? No. <laughs> All right, here Thank we goodness. go. Jillian, that's your applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.